Let's try this again. Let's try this again. If you're here, let's say hi, because I can't see anything. <laughs> no, that's not what I wanted to do. Just some, I think maybe the internet connection is being weird. I can't really tell. If you're here, say hi. If it's working for you, say hello. Nothing's happening. If nobody's here, I'll just not do it live. I'll just record a video. <laughs> I don't know what's... Oh, okay, finally. Yes, now it's working. Yay! I love it when it works. All right. I think I'm just going to kind of dig in to the topic. Uh, it's, and I, I'm going to... I I made notes, you guys, but like... I'm not really good at notes, so like I'm not really good at notes. But this is a really important thing. I it's incredibly important for me that um, I, that I'm talking about this. It's I think it's an incredibly important period. So I'm gonna turn this off. And okay, I know you guys are there, and there is some lag in the comments. So if it's weird, if I'm on Facebook, I see different comments. Should I just go? From there, like, this is so strange. Hi Genevieve, hi you guys, all of you guys who are here. I'm just welcoming you all. I can't see all of you. I know that you're, aha, uh -huh. here we go. Now I'm starting to see it, it's catching up. Okay, cool, yay, yay for the connection. All right, so I'm just gonna start off talking about what, uh, what I wrote and go from there and see how, um, see how it unfolds. Uh, as this is a live, it's, it has its, a life of its own. And I was really thinking like, oh my God, should I talk about this topic in a, like a live on my public page or should I like create a whole different page for that? But this is where I'm at and I'm not, I don't give a shit about being perfect. So <laughs> here we go. So what happened was this is a topic that is near and dear to both my husband and my heart. Uh, this whole idea of teenagers seeking affection outside of the home and not just teenagers, but children seeking affection outside the home, how we met that head on and what happened. But so today a friend of mine posted an article about 11, 12, 13 year olds having sex. Yes. Um, now Aurora, you bring up a good point, but I will not be talking about pedophilia right now. Uh, what I'm talking about is, children to children sex. So 11, 13 year olds, 15 year olds having sex with 15 year olds, 14 year olds having sex with 14 year olds. Pedophilia is a whole nother subject that can be addressed. But what I'm talking about today is about um, children seeking love and affection and, and, and uh, in that confusion, having sex with each other. So this is not, this isn't necessarily, this is not about pedophilia um, unless you define pedophilia as two children having sex. I do not. But I just want to be really clear that that's a whole other subject that is worth having a conversation about, but it won't, that was, a, you know, it's not this conversation. This conversation is about children reaching outside of the home and going with each other. So this article was about just that, that um, because of, the article was blaming porn for the reason that children are having sex. And it was also talking about like that it's damaging to the girls' bodies because they were having anal sex. And it went, it goes on and on. And I posted it in the post that I wrote below. It's somewhere down in there. There's a link to that article. But as I was reading the article and the article was saying like, you know, these aren't kids from the ghetto. They're kids from like really good, good uh, homes. And I was just like, this thing was like riling up in me because I'm like, why are they not asking? Why are children seeking sex with other children. Why is that not being asked? Why is that not being addressed? Because that to me is the root. It is the root of it. Yes, and porn, you guys, is a whole nother subject too. Um, porn, you need to be talking to your kids about it. Like that to me is just a very clear, you need to be talking to your kids about it, not shaming about it, not um, making it like taboo or wrong, but like, really just talking to them about it. And the way that I do that, my husband does that. We talk about our own experience, how we feel. Um, if 
uh, porn is a no for me. It's a big no for me personally. Like it's a no. I don't think it's healthy uh, for healthy relationships to develop. I don't, especially sexual ones. I don't think it's a healthy thing. That's for me. Um, my husband um, went through his own like um, search and awakening with that and also um, has a really good perspective, but that's for him to share. Um, but porn is not the reason that 13 year olds are having sex with each other. It's not the reason. It may be a, like a an added factor, but it isn't. So we can talk about porn and another thing too, but I just want to be really clear that if you have kids that are on the internet, please talk to them about porn from like a, a place of calm, a place of not triggered, a place of clarity, and not a place of blame, shame, and guilt. Explore it with them and you need to be talking about it because they are being exposed to it. If they're on the internet, it's a guaranteed thing and you just go with your eyes wide open. But that's not the reason that young children are having sex. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you for even being interested in this topic. And a lot of things I'm going to address might be triggering. Uh, that's not my intention at all. But this is just a really intense subject. And my views on it are radical and unique and very clear. And I need to really just get that out there. You talk about living clean mind, body, and spirit with your kids. Um, I don't know what living clean means, but I'm going to talk about what happens at the teenage break. So the preteen, the teenagers, like why do they seek, why is there such a high level of children across the board of all socioeconomic backgrounds, of all um, races, religions, cultures, um, what at some cultures it's less, you know, land, like countries and things like that. But what what is causing this amount, especially like in the Western world? Let's talk about the the UK, the US, Australia. Um, why are these kids seeking out affection at that level that they don't understand? They're not ready to have sex when they're thirteen. Let's be clear, like they're not cognitively. So what I'm talking about today is cognitive cognitive sexual development. They're not cognitively ready to have sex when they're 13. They're not cognitively ready to have sex when they're 15. They're just about perhaps cognitively ready when they're about 18, 19, 20 years old. Cognitively, like that they understand what it is, sexuality. What is sex? What is sexuality? And I'm going to talk about like what gets broken and why they search for that and what needs to be implemented so that they don't have the need to go out and be confused and, and have sex with each other in order to understand sexuality. So one of the biggest reasons that kids go outside the home for affection and sexuality when they're young, 11, 13, um, however that is, is because at home, there's not a healthy um, a, a relationship model of healthy affection. And affection, this is a good thing, what is affection? So when my, the, the uh, dictionary's definition of affection is a gentle feeling of fondness or liking. I, there is physical affection and there's emotional affection and there's presence affection. So I'm not just talking about like hugging, cuddling, um, snuggling, uh, body, you know, touching, holding hands, stroking face. I'm not just talking about that. I'm talking about the affection of two. It's like, hey, kid, 11-year-old, 15-year-old kid, hi, I love you. What are you doing? What are you interested in? How are you doing? Like being genuinely interested in, the, in, in your child, taking time out of paying the bills and, and going to work and all the stress that is life and being like, I'm going to put that over there and I'm going to be present to my child. That's a form of affection. I care about you. I'm not going to let you squirm out of being cared for. I'm going to keep caring for you. So we're not just talking about physical affection, although that is a big chunk of why young kids go out and start having sex with each other. Okay, they're looking for that affection. Every human has this need and desire for deep, deep, deep affection. And we know instinctually we're supposed to get it from our family of origin. And if we don't get it from our family of origin, 
of origin for a myriad of reasons, which I'm going to talk about, we will seek it out side of that home. We will seek it out in a not such a safe environment. We will seek it out in a way that we don't even know that we're seeking it out. It's unconscious, but I want that affection. I want somebody to like me. I want somebody to make me feel special, right? I, I, it goes from an internal compass to an external compass like that. Thank you, Steve. I love you. Um, so what happens for the child, and we'll talk about it from the parent's side, I think, as well, but for the child is they're 8, 9, 11, depending on their body size, depending on how they develop and when they develop, they're allowed into the circumference, usually, of the parent, right, in a healthy environment, in a healthy relationship with a healthy parent. They're allowed to sit on the lap, you stroke their back, you give them kisses on the cheek, you tuck them in it to bed at night. They're still little bodies. They get treated like little bodies. And there's a little, we have less stigma around affection to, to our, our small children. It seems more natural, but this is just a story that we've been taught. So when the preteen stands up and comes up, um, and it becomes eye level with you. So not only is that happening, the child grows to be eye level with you as a parent, but their body begins to look more like yours, like an adult's. The girl develops breasts. A boy develops more muscles. His voice deepens. He gets hair. They both get hair. Um, all these things start happening. Yes, Leonie. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So most adults don't even know themselves what sex and making love really is, or they are wearing masks and have a hard time. This is the thing. Why don't they know? Because they started having sex too early. And I'm not going to get into this. Is, for me, this is not about morals or what's right or what's wrong. It's cognitively, they're not, it's, it's too early. I, my sexual, earliest sexual things that happened was I was 12 years old and I was raped by a 14 year old. That was my first sexual experience, external to my own sexual experience with myself. Um, then when I was 15, I chose to have sex. Neither one of those times was I anywhere near being ready. And um, when we're seeking affection outside of ourselves, we will get into situations that aren't good for us. And I'm not, um, this is just the way it is. We will seek out affection from people that, that, that are struggling for affection themselves and don't know what it is, right? So... I'm trying to figure out how to structure this. I'm not a super structured person, but there is some structure to this. So what happens when the child's body starts being adult is the parent will be triggered by their own childhood at that time. So if their parents rejected them, they will start to reject and they will reject on the basis that it's not okay. Right? So here's, we come, here's what we come into this word that is so triggering, appropriate. What is appropriate affection? A healthy, normal adult realizes and understands that a child is not a sexual object at all. Children are not sexual. They're not. And what happens when the body starts becoming an adult, but there's still a child in there, people get confused. Where do I, what's appropriate? And instead of like figuring it out, what's appropriate for me, they just reject the child. Because it's so uncomfortable. It's icky. It's squirmy. It's weird. Right? Instead of being like, wait a second. Who am I and where am I in this? Where, where do I stand when it comes to affection with my child who is now in an adult-like body? What is my role here? We've never talked about it, you guys. Nobody's talking about it. I am. Here I am. And I'm going to never shut up about it. So, um... This is the time where it's like, you, what do, here's how it works, really. So until they're 11 or until their body becomes more adult, the affection, appropriate affection, is parent-led, really. Like you are hugging and kissing and making sure that they feel loved and, and being with them. As soon as they hit this level of like being at the size of you and their body starts to change to an adult body, there it is going to need to become child-led affection. Um, but there has to be a deep connection between you. Because if, if you don't already have affection, 
with them at this point and you try to like bring in affection when they're teenagers, they're going to push back a little bit because it's scary. And it's not for the teenager to create affection and connection. It is always up to the adult in the relationship to hold responsibility for the care and affection in the relationship. It is never the responsibility of the child. So for example, now both my teenagers daily check in with affection with me and my husband daily on the daily. All my kids do, but my teenagers specifically 15 and 17, uh, 17 year olds, a boy, 15 year olds, a girl, they check in. And as soon as they come into my space for affection, I'm wide open. I am wide fucking open. I'm like, come here, baby. I got you. And I hold them until they leave. Right. If they sit down to me on the table, I, I, I soft their back. And sometimes they flinch. I let go. I let, okay, cool. Like I respect their boundaries, right? It's very rare that happens. Um, if, if they're in a, if in an upset, I'm like, can I soft your back? I'm very, um, aware that they have different boundaries now. And this is the fun part about being a parent. It's like figuring it out, loving them for what they're in. Um, but what happens is at that age, 11, 12, the child, you'll hear a lot about he's too old to be holding hands or, uh, I don't, I had a client. I don't want to hug my daughter. She has boobs. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, that's a reason to not hug her because she has boobs? Like, what do you think that is sending a message to her about her boobs and about her body? I'm not able to do it, Shanti. I can't let her in and it's destroying me my heart and my brain. Okay, well, this is something. First, be gentle with yourself that you're not able, right? This is really big. Be gentle with yourself because you... you you are able, I promise. I promise. So it's whatever you're struggling with or with this, with your daughter is yours. It is yours. These are your triggers. This is where your, this is your growth spot. This is where you get to be like, okay, what's really this about within me? Because I promise you it has nothing to do with her. This is your opportunity to do different, to be like, okay, this is a place where I can grow. This is a place where I can see where I feel like it's not appropriate. I can see where I was rejected at that age. What would you have needed from your parental unit at that age? And then get really, really honest with yourself about it. What would I have needed? And then, and because Jenny knows the work that I do, give it to yourself first. And then you can begin to give it to her. Don't let your triggers get in the way. Because it's hurting you. Like you just said, this isn't about her. It's destroying you. You want to have that connection. You want to have that. I wasn't given it and I don't feel it or understand how to do it. Good. There's there's the, the honesty that we need to have, right? So I was hugging my daughter and I asked myself. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Beautiful. Yeah. It's like, oh, I can still do these things, right? I love that you're making progress, Robin. So I wasn't given it either. I wasn't given it either. I didn't even know, like, I realized, like, for truth in my body, that my parents loved me when I was 23 years old. Before that, I, I literally, I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know. Like, there was doubt. I didn't know. It doesn't mean I'm broken. It doesn't mean I can't do different. It doesn't mean I can't learn to be affectionate. Right? And look, affection is different across the board. Some of us are more touchy-feely and we need it. Like that, that's what I said. Affection isn't just limited to physical affection, although this is super fucking important that we're touched. Even if it's just like when you're talking to somebody and you touch their shoulder, right? Or you're talking to somebody in their hand and you touch their arm. Like super important. But another form of affection is I'm here for you. Talk to me. What's going on with you? I care about you. This is another form of affection of like, you're not too much. You're not a burden. You're not bad for me. You don't stress me out. I'm so fucking glad you exist. These are forms of affection that don't necessarily have to do with physical affection. A physical affection can arise out of that. But it's first and foremost, let me set aside my busy adult bullshit mind. Love it, but set it aside and see the child in front of me. See them. Just see them. 
That's what they, they just want to be seen. They want to know, oh, you see me, you care. And I truly believe that your daughter knows that you care. She does know. I, As I know you, Jenny, she knows that you care. Just keep nourishing and cultivating that care. Keep letting her know that she matters to you. And you do this. I promise you, you are already doing it. This is not... You're not broken. This is something, it's not something that you don't do. You do do it. It's about now coming to that place where you can amplify it for yourself. Yes, we all have our boundaries, kids and adults. I can't wait. Let the tears flow. Let them come. Let them come. This is what this work is about. My work on parenting isn't just for parents. It's for anyone who's ever been a child. Super, super important. All affection, I don't have any issues with my kids. My kids as babies used to kiss me on the lips and people freaked out. It's like, what? They are bigger now. They love huggies. Yeah, yeah. The whole, you know, the, they freak out because... <sighs> Sex has been sexualized. This is a, I know this sounds really strange and I want to get to how do we come back? How do we come back from this? That's really important that we get to that before this, but, um, I still, my daughter, right? She's 15. still kissing your lips. My son was like, nope. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, that's his boundary. I fully 100% respect that. The reason that we're all, that there's a big break is because we're terrified. Any healthy adult Okay, what do I need to say here? <sighs> One of the reasons we're terrified of our feelings around sexuality and growing children is because we know, those of us that are bothered by it, let me just tell you, those of us who are like, I don't know what to do here, I feel really uncomfortable, and my daughter has breasts, or my son is as big as me and he wants to hug me or sit on my lap, and... That comes from us knowing that our child is never going to be sexual in, in any way, shape, or form to us. And we're like, how do I move through affection with this person who's adult-sized um, and not, and it's not sexual? Well, how do you do that? You just know it's not. It's not sexual. It will never be sexual with your child. And if you have sexual ideologies about your child, you need to take care of that. Let's be clear. I know for a fact I'm never ever going to be sexually attracted to my child. That's, it's, a, it's like not even like, no, no. And because I know that, it makes it easier for me to be affectionate with my kids. In, in, right? I know the difference between affection and sexuality and dementedness. So if you're having that, then you need to talk to somebody. You need to get yourself, you need to take care of that. There's nothing, there's nothing innately wrong with you having those feelings, but you need to take care of that. You need to do that work. You are the adult. But what's happening is, just one second, sorry. I've been all morning, so I was taking all my life. I want to run, but I want to escape. Okay, Jenny, let's see if we can um, connect maybe next week and like really just have a conversation around that for you, okay? Um, but stay here with us today. Because um, it's taking over your life because that's her age, right? And it's the age where you have a lot of pain. It's the age where there's just some triggers there coming up, right? And those are terrifying because they're coming up because you can handle them now because you're an adult, right? And she's like a catalyst for all of that. So not only is she going through what she's going through, you're going through what you're going through. So hold the space for the preciousness of both of you. Being present with my children is very important. I think we're very long to all of them. Thanks. Thanks. Me too. I wouldn't call them wrong. I wouldn't call them wrong. Like, I love my life. I'm glad that I went through what I went through. I wouldn't wish it on anybody else. Um, but it's why I can do the work I do now. Because I was starved of affection and attention. A child will always look for that elsewhere with their peers. And Unfortunately, we carry the starvation into adulthood. Yes, and and I promise you we can come back from it. I promise you. Uh, let me see what rubs. Exchange clean with clear energy then. A lot of that you can do through the practice of mind makes...
I love Robert that you are here in this in this conversation. Thank you. I love that you are here in this conversation. It is so important in the course, the parenting course that I'm doing. My my husband is teaching the course on affection and teenagers. It's so important to have men in this conversation. I cannot tell you how important it is. Is there anything you're saying? Or about, yeah, I guess every time we say bye on the phone or he leaves his mother, we say, I love you. Yes. I don't think he has the slightest interest in sex yet. He's happy being a kid. He covers his eyes. Yes. Yes. Thank you. So that's a good point. This is kind of like a segue into cognitive. What can we do to let our children have a childhood where they're not seeking affection externally, but they get it from us? And it does, it's not like, I'm not talking about like, like slobbering all over, you know, I'm, just normal, natural affection that is awkward. And it's only awkward because we don't, we don't accept that this is not a, we're never going to have a sexual relationship with our kids. Most healthy people know this. And again, pedophilia is a whole other story um, that needs being addressed, but not here. This is about family, healthy family dynamic relationships. One, do your children see you being healthily, beautifully, not healthily, positively affectionate with your partner? Super important. Like kissing and snuggling and hugging and, and being present with your partner. Do they, are they seeing that? Because that's a big thing. Are they seeing you be happy and sweet and liking and having a gentle fondness for each other? Big one. Whether you're together with a person or not. You know, when, when my, when, when my neighbor comes over, I stand close, I lean in, I touch her shoulder or her arm, or we talk or we laugh and we touch each other's hand. That's affection. So, um, that's important. Positive affection in relationships at home. Seeing it, watching it happen in front of them, right? And my 12 year old gets all giggly when, you know, when we kiss and stuff, like she's been watching us kiss all her life, but all of a sudden she's in that, Ooh, right? As her hormones start to wake up her own sexuality inside herself, it gets really weird and uncomfortable. Does that mean I don't talk to sex, talk to her about it? No, I do. I talk to her about, tell me, what are you experiencing? <laughs> right? And her older sister and her brother come in on that conversation. We're a family when it comes to this. And I do, just because she's squirmy doesn't mean I don't talk about it. Doesn't mean I don't hold the space for it. It means I sit with the squirmy and I, I, I'm with the squirm because there's going to be a point where she stops being squirmy and she starts being interested in talking about it and wanting to understand the feelings in her body and wanting to understand what's happening. But from a very innocent point of view, kids do not sexualize anything Boys will begin to uh, understand uh, the visual sexualization, that they're sexual uh, around, depending on them and the kid that they are, between 14 and 16. Girls a little bit later begin to understand that, oh, this feeling in my body can relate to another body. That it's no longer just me um, exploring myself. But, oh, this, this could have a connection with someone else. Like, th that cognition does not happen until 14, 16, 78. It doesn't, like, really start to recognize, oh, if I kiss some, you know, to see that there's an, a dynamic, that there's something, that they don't have it. It's not there. And yet we will give them cognition. We will force it on them. We, they are being bombarded by it in the media. Um, and, and it's, it's not something they can even like really put together inside themselves. Super important is to support at all. This, okay. Let me see. I think I wrote this down. No, I did. Is to support and even nourish their own exploration of themselves. No, no, no. You're not talking about how to do it. Mm -mm, you're not talking, you're not like, I, I make love to my husband. I'm not doing it on the couch and I'm not giving my kids a play by play. That's private. But allowing them to um, even talking about, oh, well, you're self pleasuring yourself. And that's awesome. Like um, my kids all kind of started like at the, on the couch. And I'd be like, that's so cool. I really love that you're exploring yourself and there's a space for that. And that's, that's a, and no blame, shame or guilt. No, that's bad. It's wrong. But just like, that's for you. 
that's like, that's your own magic. That's your own space. That's for you to totally explore it till the day's end in your space that's yours because it's sacred. It belongs to you. Allowing that, knowing that this is so important. Most of us are broken sexually because we have not had this five, six, year, seven year window of exploring only and solely ourselves. Clean and clear of blame, shame, or guilt. Clean and clear of over-sexualized society bullshit. Like, what is it to be in my body? What do I like? How does that feel good? Maybe it's like with a stuffed animal. Maybe it's with my hands. Maybe it's with a pillow. Whatever that is that is explored and honored and given space and respect. But it's still talked about. And it's in Swiss, it's called self-pleasuring. And we've taken that on. We don't use the word masturbation. I'm not against the word masturbation. My kids would not know what the fuck masturbation meant. Masturbation is not a word a child understands. It's not. <laughs> self-pleasuring is like, oh yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. And it's cool. And I'm, I'm okay to talk about it. I talk openly, especially with my 15-year-old and my 17-year-old about pornography, about what's on the internet, about their sexuality, about how pornography will, if the more they watch it, it will start to influence their own sexuality, which is sacred to themselves. That it does influence them. It does change their relationship to sexuality within themselves. That sacred connection that they have with themselves. I have those conversations. It's important that we have these conversations with our kids, with each other even, where we're not tantalizing or over sensationalizing it but like sex is a very normal natural thing for us as human beings it's not it's not more special than anything else it's beautiful and awesome it's like breathing um the reason we have the issues that we do around sexuality is because of the over sensationalization of it because of porn porn not porn over sensationalizes sex we you and i normal ass people know that sex is awkward as fuck Making love is, is awkward and messy and raw. And innocent. So, how do we come back? This is what I want to tell you. If you have children that are in this age range and, and you know that they have had sex, don't shame them for it. Don't. And, but also don't like normalize it. Like, it's totally cool you're having sex. It's like, let's talk about that. How is it affecting you? How are you feeling about yourself? Are you okay? Right? Because I'm telling you, a 13 year old who's having sex is like all totally fucking confused in themselves. And that they don't need you coming at and throwing your confusion at them. It's like, I'm here. Do you want to talk about it? I love you. And creating a completely non-judgmental, completely unconditional container for them to talk to you about it. And they're going to be weird about it. And they're going to feel strange about it. because, And you're going to be weird about it. And you're going to feel strange about it. And you still need to talk about it. We need, 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 need to be talking about this in our homes. Kids, if you're waiting for your kids to get sex education at school, you have a problem. That's, it's not, that's not where kids need to learn about this. Kids need to learn about this at home with you where they're safe and loved and cared about. <sighs> I'm just going to keep saying this. You need to talk about it. You need to talk about it. You need to talk about it. And I'm not talking about it. Don't. And if you're uncomfortable talking to your kids about sex, that's awesome. Talk to them about that. Talk to them about like, I am really fucking, this feels awkward. Oh my God, I'm having a heart attack. I don't know how to talk to you about this, but I really think it's important to talk about it. And you just go and you just start talking about it because they're feeling awkward about it too. But like, don't pretend that you know about it better than they do. I don't know what my kid's experience is. I want to know. That's why I ask questions. And I also talk about my own perspective. Like I talk about how porn made me feel as a woman, as a, as a human, like, how it affected me internally, how it affected me in my mind, how long it took for me to like wash that shit out of my head when I was having self-pleasuring time with myself. How do I come back to being myself? Like being honest about your experience about it. Be congruent. Be in integrity. If you are watching porn 
Again, I'm not going to go into moralistics. I don't think porn is good for you. But if you are watching porn, you have no right to be telling your child not to be. I don't care how old they are. You need to sit down and talk to them and say, I watch porn. This is the effect on me. This is how it affects my sexuality with your, with your mother, your father, with my sexual partners. This is why I turn to porn, because I have a faster orgasm, because I'm lazy, because uh, I'm bored, because I'm trying to avoid my feelings. But like, honest, 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 honest. And not porn is bad and porn is wrong. Porn is not right for me. And porn is not really right for children at all. But if they're doing it, I'm not going to approach them from a shaming perspective because this will never work, you guys. This will do more harm than anything else. It's okay, you're watching it. What do we do now? How does it make you feel? What's happening to you? How does it make you think? What? How is it changing your perspective about your own body? How does it change your perspective about men or women? Like, how is this, how is this like living inside of you? This is super important. And a 13 year old having sex with a 13 year old, 14 year old having, it's awkward. It's weird. And what's going to happen is the child will bond with another 14 year old and, and, um, swivel its loyalty and affection and understanding to the, to the, to its peers. And that's going to cause a rift in the relationship between the parent and the child. If when the child wants to spend more time with its peers than it does at 13 and 14, there's, there's a, a, a gap in, in the relationship. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Like there's a gap in the relationship. There's a separation between the parent and the child. And it's not what the parent wants. And it's not what the child wants. I promise you, you can come back from a rift. You can. And it's about being clear bringing back your own integrity, bringing back affection and care. Like genuine, like, hey, I see you. Like, not like, you know, life can get really busy. And you start to focus on grades and you start to focus on paying your bills and you start to focus on how stressful life is and you forget to see the child that's in front of you. And when you forget to see the child that's in front of you, the child will turn to anyone who will see it. And then it's not just that we care. I would do that too. I will always gravitate to the person who cherishes me the most. The person who gives me the most attention. Now, I know the difference between being cherished and being an object. Because I'm an adult and I've been through a lot. Right? So I, But I still, I will gravitate towards friends, colleagues who actually cherish me. Who actually, like, give a shit. Who actually give me affection and attention. Hello, Shanti. I see you. I love you. I care about you. That's a human need. It's a deep, it's one of our deepest rooted human needs. Is the need for affection and a gentle feeling of being liked, of, of fondness. A gentle feeling of fondness. Somebody cares. Right? And we've gotten confused. We think that sex is caring. We think that sex is the most ultimate level of affection. It can be, but it's not it. We'll strive to have sex all our lives with all these different partners to try to get to fill this hole of affection that can't be filled with sex. It can't. I don't know how many of you have had empty ass sex. I have. Not for the tw last 20 years, but before that, sex is not, a, is not what we're seeking. But we think that if I have sex, I'm going to get that affection. I'm going to get that feeling of fondness from somebody. It's the reason children are having sex. The reason children are having babies. Isn't because, I mean, there is an effect in the culture, in the media, that there's so much sex, sexualization of stuff that doesn't need to be sexualized. Clothing, um, they need to be able to express that. They need to be able to, they need to be able to explore their sexuality within the walls of the home. Not, like I just said, I'm not having sex with my husband on my couch. Like, that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> but that they have the space to talk about, hey, um, like, it was really interesting to have the conversation about porn with my 15-year-old daughter and how um, different it is for her than it is for my son. And wow, it's like, it's like it blows my mind. It opens up ideas. Of, and I want to be open. Like, I don't go in thinking I know better. I go in being like, tell me everything. What's your experience? How do you see that? Here's mine. And some, I got some strong opinions about it. 
but giving space to them to tell me what their experience is and not making any of it wrong, but speaking of my own experience. Um, the other reason is <sighs> unknowingly, usually unconsciously, we will withhold affection to try to affect our child's behavior. We will withhold affection to try to manipulate, control, and bully our child into being, doing, seeing, acting the way that we want them to. This has to stop. It has to. It has to stop. It's not effective, and it's going to hurt you and your child in the long run. How does this look? Your child does something. They sneak out of the house. Uh, they stay on their phone longer than they're supposed to with some person. And you withdraw your affection. And you tell them what they're doing wrong. Instead of affection being the first point of contact with your child. This is super important. Affection. My husband comes in the door from work and we're all over him. We, we clobber him. We love him. Everybody's hugging him. He comes to me. He kisses me. First point of contact is affection. So if my kid snuck out and I caught them, the first thing I would do is be like, oh man, I'm so glad you're here. I was worried. I don't know where you were. I'm so glad you're alive. I love you. Now, you snuck out. What do we do? Point, first point of contact is affection. Oftentimes, the kid does something we don't like. We withdraw affection. We tell them everything they did wrong. We tell them everything they need to do right. And then maybe if they get it, we'll give them affection again. We'll open the doors of affection. It can't keep working like this. The child will automatically turn to its peers. Because it's not going to, it's not, we're intelligent. And we're, children are emotionally intelligent. And they're like, I'm not playing those games. I'm not going to jump through hoops for you to be connected to you because you're my parent and this is my family so where I'm supposed to be safe but I will go out and jump hoops for people who, out there who aren't part of my family I will go out there and do that it's a very interesting paradigm and dynamic something to be aware of never ever use affection as a, a reward or punishment taking it away or giving it affection needs to be the first point of contact with your child at all times like, when my kids come home from school, it's always like, hey, hi, like, connection, I see you, I'm so glad you're here. How was your day? Sometimes it's not how was your day, because I'm working, but if I'm working on my computer and they come in, it's, hey, hi, I'm so glad you're here. I connect. Affection has to be the first connection. And if they, they're they late or whatever, I'm not like, oh my god, you're late. It's like, oh, I'm so glad you're here. You're late. <laughs> that This is so big. And it makes such a difference in the connection with your child, with anybody. Apply it to any relationship. We need that affection to survive and to thrive. We need it to thrive. And while I love myself and I give myself affection and I am good at self-pleasuring, I need affection from the people in closest to me. I need it. And if you don't have people cl close to you, then you need it still. You need it still. I'm not even sure how to do that dynamic, but I'm positive that it's possible. Because I live in like a clan, <laughs> a tribe of people. Right? I don't know what it is to live alone. Um, I know what it is, though, to live in a tribe of people and not be, have affection. That sucks. That sucks, too. So I get that part. We need affection. We need each other. We need the affection of the people closest to us, the people that we allow into our personal space. We need affection. And in order to stop, or at least decrease or minimize teenage sex and pregnancy, they need to be getting that affection at home. And again, my affection, how I am towards my kids, won't be your affection. So don't, I, like, you know, I didn't have the picture either. I didn't have positive aff um, affirmations, <laughs> positive bleh, affection or relationships as a I didn't see it. I didn't grow up with it. I didn't know what it looked like. Somewhere in me, I knew what it felt like. I knew the longing. You know that longing? I don't know if you guys do, but you know that longing you have to have attention and affection from somebody? And the feeling that you get when you have it? 
I know what that felt like. And we can cultivate that. We can bring that up. We can nourish that into being alive so that it's between us and somebody else. We can create the experience. And so that we know when we meet somebody and they don't have it and they're not able to, it's like, okay, where's the people that can and are able? And, and how is... I'm just saying you don't need to have had an example of it to live it. You don't. I live it. I live it deeply with my husband, with my children. I, I even had a couple boyfriends before my husband that were like, oh, you know, not, not so much um, public displays of affection. And it, it crushed me. I'm like, what? Like, they didn't want to hold my hand in public. Uh, privately, they were very affectionate, very loving, very dear, whatever. But it was like, oh, you can't, you know, you can't uh, hold my hand. And that crushed me. So I know that I needed somebody in my life who was going to let me love them. And be as affectionate as I need it all the time, public or not. That's what I need. And me as a human. And there's other people that are like, oh, don't touch me. But they're like present to you. They're like really able to hear you and listen to you and see you. And that's affection too. Seeing girls disconnect from themselves, maybe in confusion and fear, to feel wanted and desired by a boy is particularly in this. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, boys get rejected in a different way than girls get rejected at this age. Yeah. So, boys get rejected differently than girls. Boys will simply be told, um, well, and not just told, there's a lot of shit that goes on that is under the, the um, it's unspoken, but it's very clearly, like, delivered. Okay, so boys get, get told... Um, there's not going to be any more hand-holding here. You know, it's a tough, like, you got to grow up now. You got to get over being a kid. You got to be a man. And they're like, 11. Like, I, I've, I've seen this being said to eight, five-year-olds. Like, it's just, I'm like, what? Anyway, so boys will get rejected in this way of like, you know, bah, and girls would be rejected for their body, for their breasts, for their hips, for their developingness. Right, a boy is gonna be, it's got to be harsh, but it's not necessarily because they grow pubic hair, or they um, their body is changing. Girls are rejected categorically because their boobs, and you don't have to say anything. It can just be, it can be silent. But she, like you know, the hug gets weirder. Like you lean into your dad or your mom, and you get a hug, and they do this, and they're just trying to hug you like this, or they, they're just gonna hug you from the side. So it can be a really um, not direct but indirect way of saying your body's not okay, right? And um, when we talk about self-pleasure or masturbation, it's more of a conversation amongst boys and men than it is amongst women. So girls are not necessarily nurtured or nourished that it's okay for them to have that deep, loving, sensual connection to themselves. So these are the reasons that I see girls in particular um, like kind of, abandoning themselves and their ideas is because they haven't had long enough to develop that relationship with themselves, that sensual, this is my body, this is what feels good, this is what I like relationship with themselves. This needs to be nurtured. This needs to be given space. This needs to be given spoken word like, hey, I'm so glad that you're self-pleasuring. I'm so glad that you've discovered your body in this way. I hope you do that for the rest of your life. Like, the, the space to be held in that. Um, so, yes, I do see that. Um, and I see the opposite of it in my own house. I see what I'm talking about. Um, it's so it's so beautiful. My kids are so grounded. Um, my 17-year-old, who is exploring, oh, there's this, this sexuality thing has to do with another person and all these things, also knows he's not ready. I'm not ready for that. But I, I'm like, I'm excited. I'm excited that it's like an option in my life. But I'm not ready for that. And I'm just like, dang, when I was 17, you don't want to know what I was doing with my body. Um, sexually, you know. I, I sure shit did not know that. Um, and my daughter, too. She's like, oh, God, no. She's like, if I... She's like, getting in a relationship is serious. Like, you have to be really committed to that if you're going to get into that. And I just like sit gobsmacked. And this is the difference between being rejected and being accepted fully. 
with affection, with presence, with somebody who cares about you, with sexuality being a topic that you talk about. Like it's normal in my house to talk about it. It's just normal. We talk about it and we talk about all the aspects of it. I remember when my oldest were about nine and seven or eight and they came home and said, the kids are making jokes about condoms and they made a joke and me and Casper, like, that doesn't make any sense. And we're like, do you guys know what a condom is? And they're like, no. And I went to the store and I got condoms and I gave them a banana and I showed them what a condom was and they both went, what? That joke's not even funny. Like, talk about it. Bring the subject in. And if you're uncomfortable talking about it, notice you're uncomfortable talking about it and bring that into the conversation. Notice where you feel like you weren't allowed, you know, like you, I didn't learn about sex from my parents. Maybe you didn't either. So notice where you like, you don't have a role model in that. So you are the role model. That's the cool part. You get to forge the role model yourself. How do I, how would I want this done? How would I want to be talked to? How, how could I do this in a way that feels like not so awkward? And I'm awkward as fuck, you guys. <laughs> like, ask my kids any day. I am awkward as fuck, but I would rather be awkward than not talk about it. Why do you think some people are okay with private affection but are not in public? Um, I don't know. Because it's, when you're truly affectionate, it's a very vulnerable, it's a very vulnerable place. Very vulnerable. I, I think that if I had to answer that off the cuff right now, that would be my answer. I'm 30 and there's stuff I still want to ask my mom. Yes, and you make up, you bring up a really good point. Um, I want to be that place where my kids can come and ask anything. And I am that place. Like, that's what I am in my life. Um, but we also don't talk about it. Uh, openly with each other even our girlfriends like really openly like god it's so awkward or different times of the month I smell different or what do you do with this or you know like or he the, like we were doing this and I didn't like it and am I supposed to say something about that like can I say that openly to my partner like wh we're not even open with each other adult to adult about our experience we're all walking around pretending like we know something about it Pretending like we're sophisticated, sexually sophisticated. Sexuality isn't sophisticated at all. At all. It's raw and real and vulnerable and awkward and messy. And I just made love to my husband last night and I think, I just think like, there's nothing sensational about it. There's so much innocence. There's so much purity in it. When we drop all the facades and the ideas about it, when we drop pornography, when we drop ideology, when we drop all of that, it's just pure. That's all it is. Sometimes I'm talking to girls where they want to have conversations that their mothers don't have with them, where they are at boarding school. Yes. Yeah. I mean, what more? I mean, how could, what other subject are you just naturally fucking curious about when your body starts to do things? Like your nipples start to have feeling. And you're like, whoa. What? Like, it's, it's like, Whoa! It's not like, oh yeah, I'm getting on with myself. That is not <laughs> how we develop sexually. It's like, whoa, okay, okay. And you ease yourself into it if you have the space. If, if you, you ease yourself into it. It's the same thing that would happen if you come together with a partner and you both have never done it. And, and it's like, and you, neither one of you has ideologies about it, about like how it should be. You know, I gotta, I gotta be a man and I gotta be a woman and I have to make these noises and I have to look like this. Like if we don't have that, we're just like, this is kind of awkward, but I'm really excited. Like, let's see where this goes. <laughs> you know, like this, this place of innocence. This is really where I want all of us to come from. Sex was never meant to be like titillating or tantalizing or adultified if you will it's like why is this happening what is this is this okay like are, are my my nipples supposed to feel like that like is something wrong with me 
<laughs> you know, like these are really the questions that start coming up. It's this awkwardness. Like, it's nice. I like it, but it's weird. <laughs> you know, it's weird. Like, even down to my 12 year old, I don't see it yet, but she's like, I'm getting hips. Like, she's just walking, she's talking to herself. I'm, I'm just eavesdropping on her. She's like, oh my God, I'm getting, I'm getting hips. This is, oh, this is, oh, this is weird. I'm getting hips. Like, this is her exploration of herself, right? Like, my body is changing. And, like, from the external to me, it's like a little bit. You can see a little bit. But to her, it's like, my, I got fucking hips all of a sudden. It's like, whoa, whoa, what do I do with this? What do I do with this? Oh, my God. And she's exploring it. And it's the same thing that happens with sexuality if there's no blame, shame, guilt, and external crap put on it. And if the affection between the parent is still there. Here's how sex talk was handled in my house. A boy called when I was in seventh grade. My dad answered, told him I was not there. Um, my dad asked why he was calling and I said I didn't know. My dad picked up a crutch and hit me in the back as I was walking down the hall in my, to my bedroom. I fell on the ground. Stay away from boys. End of discussion. First off, uh, my first reaction is to say I'm sorry you had to go through that. I can't change it. You can't change it. But that sucks ass. That sucks ass. <clears throat> Maybe I shouldn't say that. It's kind of a sexual reference, but that just sucks. And that's the, the level of, that's like, that's an extreme level of, of what can happen, right? Is like, we're not going to talk about this. There's something wrong with you because a boy wants to talk to you. There's something wrong with you because you have breasts. There's something wrong with you because you have a boner. There's something wrong with you because you want to touch yourself because it's really fucking interesting. I got hips. I got hips. And she's just touching her hips. Right? Like, um, and it's been just years and years, eons and eons of misunderstandings around sexuality. Sexuality first and foremost needs to be given space with the person alone. Masturbation, self-exploration, no instructions. No, 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 no. No instructions, no books, no videos, no mom telling you what to do. No, no, no. Private, uninstructed, natural exploration. It's needed. When a child, like my two older children have, the space to develop that sexuality within themselves. First, they make vastly different choices about sexual partners and sexual encounters than if they don't have that, that possibility. And children who are having sex at 13 years old, 11, they can have babies. Their bodies, they're physically capable. Cognitively, they're not ready at all. It, it, it's it's mind-boggling to them. It's like trying to put on an adult helmet, right? And you can't because you're not there. You're not cognitively there. So you're pushed into a cognition that you're not ready for. That you're just not ready for. So like there's the argument sometimes, yeah, well, you physically, no, 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 no. When you're 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, you need to be self-exploring and, and having somewhere to talk about it, like what it means to you and how, if you want to talk about it. But being given the, the, like my kids, we all know, everybody in the house is doing something, 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 self-pleasuring. We all know it. And it's not a secret. And it's not bad. And it's not wrong. And it is private. It's just private. It's honored as private. And we can talk about it. Um, one woman that I know, um, I've only read parts of her story, but it's, she took a year, a couple years of being like celibate. She had a very traumatic childhood, sexual abuse and all of that, which is a whole other subject. This subject I'm talking about are just kids that do not have sexual abuse and going to be with each other it has to do with lack of affection. Um, but she took, uh, in her 20s, she took years or something as a, to be celibate, to rediscover, to go rediscover, go through that process of like claiming her own sexuality, exploring herself without instructions, without external bullshit, but just coming back to that place. It's a really important piece of sexuality that is ignored. 
and shut down and not who I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to know if my kids are masturbating. I don't want to know about that. Like that's just no. I'm not going to talk to my kids about making love to their father. What? Like my kids know that we do. It's private, but we, we talk about it. Not, we don't talk about details. Like, like this is where the mind goes like, Oh my God, I can't, you know, no, no, there's a way to talk about it. That is so innocent and, and joyful and open without going into details. The less details actually, the better, the less detailed you are. The more you're open to like, well, tell me, what's your experience? What are you doing? Do you have any questions? And then you honor them. You answer the questions from like an honest place. So there's been questions my kids have asked me. I'm like, okay. And then I would, you know, like, okay, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to just share my experience and know that if they're asking, they're ready for it. Affection in the home. Having these conversations openly with each other. Having open conversations with your partner as well. Like, I, I'm still like, like, I'm willing to talk to my husband in our bed about our sexuality, but like, I don't want to talk about it on the couch. I don't want to talk about it at the table. <laughs> like, I still feel really like that's, that's, there's a space for that, right? But openly talking about that, like, this is, this is the purity of my heart. This is how I feel about sexuality. And this is how children feel about it too. They don't understand. You know, it's like talking with my 17 year old and my husband telling him about how the effects of porn and how like, if you watch porn and then you have the opportunity to be with a woman, it's a whole nother world you cannot even fathom. And if you're using porn as a reference, you're going to get really confused. These are the kinds of conversations we need, 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 need to be having with our teenagers and our preteens. Like I said, my daughter giggles. She runs away from the, the films, you know, with nudity or kissing. And I still hold her in that. And I still talk to her about it. And her brother and sister talk to her about it. And she's like this, right? But she wants to know, like, she's, so she's peeking out, you know, she's, it's, there's still interest and curiosity, but it's like not to push it too far, right, for her. But knowing that, like, there's people here that I can talk to about this when I'm ready, right, that she knows this space is okay, that whatever she's going through, whatever she's feeling, it's okay, right? She's kind of in the age of, like, beating the boys up right now, that, like, she can't even fathom that there's, that's what I'm saying, they don't know. A 12-year-old? doesn't understand sexuality at all that there's oh there's a person coming that sexuality requires another human right boys are gross right now for her there's an innocence there that needs to be held in the house in the home not at school not with the peers but in the home there's an innocence that needs to be not just protected like, because protection implies, like, I've got to, you know, I've got to keep you on it. No, but, like, nurtured and cultivated. And it allows them to grow into their sexuality when they are ready. When they are ready. And I don't know that any of us ever really are ready. It's because when it comes, it's awkward and it's strange and it's weird and it's unexplainable. And we have to get through that, right? And if you add in like porn and external things or not enough information, like no information, it gets scary, right? So it's just enough space to talk about it from their point of view, but also to talk about it from, be honest, be honest. We've got to start talking about, like instead of normalizing teenage pregnancy, instead of normalizing teenage sex, we need to normalize talking about it at home. We need to normalize being affectionate towards our teenagers. Not normalizing sex. Even a 15-year-old is not ready. And of course, there's always the exception to every rule and all of that. But I'm still going to argue that they're not ready. They're not ready for the full collateral of a sexual relationship. It's if they're not fully tapped into the sacred sexual relationship with themselves, 
they're not ready to share that with somebody else. And it will be confusing. And this is long enough. <laughs> so um, there's so much more to come, not just about sexuality, but about affection and, and, and bringing it back, bringing back that affection. And how do you, um, as a mother, it seems more natural, right? But there's also a very deep layer to this that comes from the father. And in the course that I'm thinking it's going to be November, um, my husband, who is not on Facebook, could give a shit about Facebook, <laughs> um, will be teaching either alongside me or on his own the class on affection. Um, no, probably together. And how do you bridge the gap with your female children and with your male children? Because it's very, very different. Very different. Very, very different especially as a father. And it's really beautiful uh, what he has to share on that. I'm so, like, I can't even tell. Like, when he's like, yep, I'm there. I'm going to do it with you. I was like, holy crap. Like, that's how important this is to him. Always when it comes between us and the young person in front of us, it is just as it comes and always different. And it feels the most important present thing to rise up. To rise. Yes, it's like, how present can I, can I just drop all my own crap for a second? And just be with you, my child, who's super important to me. Can I drop all my conditioning, my ideas of what how perfect you should be or how perfect I should be? Can I just drop all that and be with you? Just for a moment. And then extend those moments throughout the day. Add them up and keep adding more into it and add more into it and add more into it. And here's the thing about it when you do it. It feels really, really good for you and for them, and you're going to want to keep creating it. Affection is our lifeblood. It is what keeps us going. It is what allows us to continue to be here and be alive. And it's so important. Family of origin is so important when it comes to affection. And if you didn't have it, it doesn't mean you can't have it. Don't forget that. Just because you didn't experience it in your childhood does not mean you can experience it now as an adult and as a parent yourself. You absolutely can because it's innate. It's innate in all of us, this affection. It's our birthright. I want to thank all of you, uh, live and replay viewers, for spending this time with me, for be, even being interested in this conversation, for, for existing you are precious to me. Thank you.